Hi, I'm Philip Wadler, and I want to welcome you to IOHK Summit 2020, where we're going to be discussing Marlowe and Plutus. I work at the University of Edinburgh and for IOHK. So I'm going to give you an overview, and then Manuel Chakravarti is going to give you details about Plutus, and Simon Thompson is going to give you details about Marlowe. So let me tell you about why I am so excited to be working for IOHK, and that's because of science. How does science progress? By publications, peer-reviewed publications. And this is how science has always progressed. But the amazing thing is IOHK has actually committed to this, right? It says everything we do, we want to be published, we want to be peer-reviewed. That's how science goes forward. And remarkably, IOHK is unique in this. Companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they will allow the people who work there to do peer-reviewed publications, but that's not important to them. That's just something that happens on the side. IOHK, publication comes first. I think that's really important. Now, the other thing that IOHK does that's near and dear to my heart is they make heavy use of my favorite functional programming language, Haskell. And IOHK is not unique in this. Haskell's been around since 1987 now. And it is in use. And one of the places it's in use is at banks and financial institutions. These are the ones I know of that use Haskell. Others use other functional programming languages. So Haskell's not unique in this. And why are financial in institutions interested in using functional languages? It's because functional languages make it easy to write something quickly and reliably. So you can write it down quickly and yet have good confidence that it's going to do what you expect it to do. And when you're doing things like automated trading, where you can spend tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars or pounds or what have you in less than a second, it's really important that you know that the program is going to do what you expect it to do. That's just the same for smart contracts. So there's a track record of Haskell and other functional languages being used for this purpose. And that's one of the things that makes them important for smart contracts. Now, right, smart contracts have been around for a while now. The most widely used system is Ethereum. And what have we learned about smart contracts from Ethereum? Well, we've learned they're very useful. But the other thing we've learned is that they are subject to regular exploits. Like clockwork, every six months, there will be another story in the news about somebody having lost hundreds of thousands of ether. So that's millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of, or pounds worth of ether due to an exploit, due to a fault in the program, due to some kind of fraud, some intentional fault sometimes in a program. So this is a serious problem, and it means that it's worth investing in getting this right. And this is one reason why functional languages, because of the reliability that I mentioned, have a great role to play. So let me tell you about our two different languages. The first of these is Marlowe. So here's Marlowe. It's not a general purpose programming language. You can't do everything in Marlowe. It's what's called a domain-specific language. And it's aimed at certain kinds of financial applications. So you can say things like, um, spend this money, make a choice of these two things, and so on. You can assign times to these. And there are two different ways of doing it. You can do it in this graphic format, or you can do it as a data structure. This is actually a Haskell data structure. So Haskell is used to implement Marlowe, but in addition, you can use Haskell to create these data structures, so to um, have programs generated by other programs. As I've mentioned, this isn't a new idea. These kinds of financial languages have been around since the turn of the millennium. 
when Simon Peyton Jones and others came up with the first one. And right here is um, the different formats in which you can deal with Marlowe. And in addition, it's all available on the web in what used to be called Meadow, I think is now called the Marlowe Playground. So all of this is uh, freely accessible on the web so you can try it out for yourself without needing to install anything. And as I've said, these have been around since the turn of the millennium. There have been several of these. Another comes from a company called DN Digital. And I find their experience with using this kind of language very interesting because what they've discovered is that there's a special role for what they call a business engineer, right? So traditionally, you'd have a business analyst, you'd have a developer, you'd have a tester. All of these are different, right? And the developer has a key role in actually writing down the code. And they have to learn what code to write from a business analyst. So what they've learned at Dion is that you can have a single individual, a business engineer, somebody trained in the domain of finance that does all this. You don't need a specialized programmer to do it because it's a high level domain specific language. You can get a domain specialist to do it directly. And this has real advantages. So I'm excited what's been learned in this field. Marlowe is another language just like this, we talk with the DN Digital people, they talk with us, um, but this experience they've had, I think is highly relevant. And then you might wonder, what does a business engineer look like? So I went out on the web and here is a picture of a business engineer for you. So let's move on and talk about Plutus. And I'll talk about the Plutus platform. And here's the thing, right? So I mentioned Ethereum before, and Ethereum is programmed in something called Solidity. So here's a crowdfunding application that was found by my colleague, Manuel Chakravarti, and it consists of 81 lines of solidity. And you think, okay, that's fine. But what's really going on, right, is that's on the blockchain. And you need something off the blockchain that invokes all these functions written on the blockchain. So it turns out it's not just 81 lines of solidity, it's also 149 lines of JavaScript. So your actual application is broken up across these two different programming languages. So what we do instead in Plutus, Plutus is really just a library written in Haskell. So it's all Haskell, it takes, gets all the advantages of a mature language, one that's been around since 1987, and it's our new library for it. And then the other thing is you can see, some of this is in green, and some of this is in blue, this is all one language, Haskell. The bits in blue, you can see they've got these special markers around them. So this dollar sign and this open bracket and this closed bracket. And what that means is you write in a subset of Haskell, which we call Plutus TX. And this is what goes into the transaction. So this corresponds to what was JavaScript before. This corresponds to what was Solidity before. Now your entire application is written in one language. We call this the batteries included. Uh, way of doing things. So it's very nice to do this. This is actually a fairly standard idea in functional programming. I did one of the earlier systems that links based on this, but Manuel had the insight that we could apply this very well to what goes on uh, on the Cardano platform with Plutus. So uh, my thanks to Manuel for working that out. So we've got everything all in one place. Now that's much better. And again, uh, you can do it on your computer, or there's a Plutus Playground that lets you try this all out online. And Plutus Playground's actually gotten fairly mature. It's really nice, all the graphics and so on, they've got built into this system now. So another thing I want to talk, a very different way in which functional programming comes into this is UTXO versus accounts. So Bitcoin and also Cardano, uh, make use of what's called UTXO, unspent transaction outputs, whereas Ethereum uses what's called an account-based way of doing things. And most people use the account-based way of doing things. It seems very natural, but there are actually some advantages to using unspent transaction outputs. So let's go over, and here's a simple example of this. So here is a transaction. This is the origin transaction, and six ADA are created and given to Alice, and four ADA are created 
and given to Bob. And you can see that because these are outputs of transaction zero. So when they're not spent yet, they are unspent transaction outputs. So now Alice spends three of her ADA by giving them to Charles. And she keeps three ADA for herself in this transaction. In this transaction, Bill gives two ADA to Charles and keeps two for himself. And you might think Charles already has enough ADA, but in fact, they're using Charles here to adjudicate something. Uh, Charles is a mediator in this case, and Charles mediates and registers another transaction that says, in fact, of those five ADA, two should belong to Alice and three to Bill. So here we've got all these unspent transaction outputs, one that gives three to Alice, one that gives two to Alice, so Alice has a total of five, one that gives three to Bill, Bob, and another that gives two to Bob, so that we've, again, Bob has a total of five. So that is the unspent transaction output way of doing things, UTXO. Here, down in the corner, is what it looks like in an account-based system. So we've got accounts for Alice, Bob, and Charles. And at the beginning, Alice had, at the beginning, Alice has six, and Bob has four, Charles has nothing, and then Alice gives three to Charles, so now Alice has three, Charles has three, and then Bob gives two to Charles, so now Bob has two, and Charles has a total of five. And then finally, Charles gives two to Alice and three to Bob, so both Alice and Bob each have five, and Charles has nothing. So that's what it looks like with account-based. You might think, oh, that's a lot simpler. But the thing about accounts is you don't know in what order these transactions will appear. So if they appear in some different order, so say this one appears before transaction two, well, this says that Charles is giving away five. Charles doesn't have five yet, so it becomes invalid. This transaction just doesn't happen. So the reason that UTXOs work so well is transaction three here specifically refers to transaction one and transaction two. With UTXO, that's the way it works. And so you know exactly what transaction three is going to do. Transaction three has to come after these two because it refers to them. With accounts, it's just whatever order things happen in, and you don't know what's going to happen. So the result of that is under UTXO, you know exactly how much gas you're going to use. But under accounts, you don't know. Depending on the order things work, your transaction might be invalid, or it might be valid, but use 10 or 20 or 30 gas. You don't know. So there's a real advantage to the UTXO approach, which people with functional programming will be familiar with, because everything just specifically refers to something else. You don't depend on the order in which things happen. And our name for that is deterministic. So Plutus is what you write things in, uh, in Haskell. Plutus is the library. And then it compiles down to a separate language to run on the blockchain. What you want on your blockchain is a very simple language, one that is going to remain valid for a long time, so that you're not going to need to do forks. You'd like it to last for, say, 50 years. Haskell hasn't even been around for 50 years, and it's evolving very rapidly. And also, much as I love Haskell, it's a very complicated system. If you want to do things like verification, it helps have a really simple system. So Plutus Core is a very simple system. And let me contrast that with what you get in Ethereum. So Ethereum runs on something called the Ethereum Virtual Machine, and that's specified in the Ethereum yellow paper. And that yellow paper actually gets pretty complicated. It goes on for quite a bit, and you can see there are lots of complicated formulas to determine what happens. So I'm a great fan of mathematics. Um, you can use it to manage complication, but even better yet is if you can have some, use mathematics to make things simple so that you don't have a lot of these complications. So Plutus Core is uh, a very simple programming language, so simple that the equivalent of the EVM can be written out on a single napkin. So this is the complete specification of the Plutus Core machine that's equivalent to the Ethereum virtual machine. And there you see it's just a few lines and it fits on the napkin. 
So how did we manage to do this? Well, it's all based um, on something called lambda calculus, which is the basis of every functional language. This was developed by Alonzo Church uh, in the 1930s. And, the int and that was when he invented lambda calculus. But at the same time, uh, again, the 1930s, Gerhard Gensen invented natural deduction. And if you wait uh, close to 40 years, in the 1980s, somebody named William Howard works out that lambda calculus and natural deduction are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So I said that Church and G Gensen had invented lambda calculus and natural deduction, but I think the right word to use, really, since they both found the same thing, is that they discovered this one thing, one is lambda calculus, and one is natural deduction. And this goes by the name of the Curry-Howard isomorphism, or propositions as types, and it happens again and again. So one time that it happened is that the logician, Jean-Yves Girard, invented something called System F in the 1970s, and at almost the same time, John Reynolds invented this thing called polymorphic lambda calculus. And a while later, people looked at these two things and they went, wait a minute, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence, they are isomorphic, they are the same thing. At which point we say, and in fact, they're both a variant of lambda calculus. They're lambda calculus with um, a nice type system. And again, we would say that therefore Girard and Reynolds didn't invent these things, they discovered this thing. And this is the basis for Plutus core. Plutus core is just this idea with um, one other idea, recursive types, that came along a little bit later and with suitable primitives, and that's it. So that's why it's so small, that's why you can fit it on a napkin. And this is IOHK's answer to the question of how do you have a programming language that lives on the blockchain and is going to be the same for 50 years? How can you do that answer Pick one that was discovered 50 years ago. So that's it. What have we seen? We've seen that IOHK makes use of peer-reviewed science. We've seen that Haskell is widely used in banks and financial institutions. We've seen that Marlowe is designed for use around finance. And again, it's an idea that's been around since the turn of the millennium and is now widely used. We've seen that Plutus has this batteries included idea so that instead of writing half in Solidity and half in JavaScript, you can do it all in a single Haskell library called Plutus. We've seen about UTXOs versus accounts and how UTXOs have some advantages. And we've seen about Plutus core and how this is a language that was not invented, but discovered and one that we can rely on we hope for the next 50 years. So that's it. That's me. I'm done with my, with my overview. And let me hand over to Manuel Chakravarti, who's going to tell you about Plutus. Hello, I'm Manuel Chakravarti. Now that Phil has outlined the basics of functional smart contract, let's continue with an overview of our latest research results out of the Plutus team. Phil has explained that we are using functional programming to provide a safe and deterministic programming environment for smart contracts. Now, we have taken this to the next level and provide custom token functionality natively in the ledger in a lightweight, affordable, and most importantly, also safe manner. If you're looking at Ethereum, where custom tokens are probably the most important use case, then there are two standards, the ESC20 standard for fungible tokens, tokens which are exchangeable, and the ESC721 standard for non-fungible, unique tokens, which you can use to represent virtual or uh, physical objects. Now, unfortunately, the use of these standards on Ethereum is inefficient in that the ledger functionality is replicated in user-defined smart contract code. 
it is expensive because it attracts quite a bit of uh, smart contract execution costs, gas, and it's quite complex because of replication of code and other complications. Now, let me go through these three main pillars of our proposal for custom tokens. What does make them lightweight? Well, let's look at the single asset ledger, Cardano in the Shelley era. If one transaction transfers funds to another, then this is always in terms of ADA or actually in terms of Loveless, which is one millionth of ADA. We generalize this to a multi-asset setting by allowing these ADA funds to be accompanied by other custom tokens, whether they are fungible or non-fungible. This structure where we bundle multiple fungible, non-fungible tokens into one transfer, we call token bundles. These token bundles are the basis for our system. This representation, as you're seeing now, where we just have the quantities and the token names, is fine for custom currencies, just like this MyCoin. But once we're going to non-fungible tokens, especially because in reality, they are usually represented by cryptographic hashes, where you can't derive a relationship between different types of tokens, which belong to the same type or group, it's actually quite convenient to go to a two-level structure where we have inside the token bundle a set of assets and under each asset there can be multiple kinds of tokens, both fungible and non-fungible. Of course, it's crucial to extend this structure in a manner that the standard ledger rules still hold. In particular, we need to be able to add these quantities up. So if you're having two token bundles, then we can add them by adding those which are applying to the same asset type, just numerically, and the others we combine into their respective asset groups. Now this simple but powerful structure immediately allows us to easily implement one of the most important operations on a multi-asset system, an atomic swap, where Alice pays her coins to Bob, and Bob pays Alice in terms of ADA. Now, what's crucial is that if one party fails to pay, the other payment doesn't get through. So either both payments or none. That's what we call atomic. If you look at the Cardano UTXO ledger, then this works quite nicely with a single transaction. Let's assume Alice locks the 51 MyCoin with her key and Bob blocks the 300 ADA. And now we create a transaction consuming both. This transaction, because it con uh, consumes tokens locked by Alice and tokens locked by Bob, must be signed by both. Otherwise, it will not be valid. And then the output just assigns the tokens to the two parties in the opposite order. And that gives us a swap. Now, if one tries to cheat, let's say Bob doesn't pay all the ADA to Alice, then Alice, upon inspecting this transaction, will just refuse to sign it, which means the transaction won't be valid at all. This provides atomicity without any further mechanism. We just have standard UTXO and token bundles. This simplicity makes it a rather lightweight system, which has a great advantage for users because if we look at a single transfer, and we do that in a system such as Ethereum's ERC20 non-native tokens, then we have to execute some smart contract functionality, in particular the transfer function of ERC20. That execution attracts an execution fee called gas. So you pay for transfers extra money. On a native multi-asset system, transferring your own coins is as easy and as cheap as ADA transfers, no additional execution or smart contract execution fee. Even better, if the transfer is not between two people, 
but two contracts, then on Ethereum with ERC-20, there's even more contract code in ERC-20 which needs to be executed, which makes this even more complicated and more expensive. Again, in a native multi-asset system such as Cardano, using ADA or your own cryptocurrency or your own tokens, it's all the same, easy and affordable. Now, it is great to have a lightweight and affordable system, but it's crucial for it to be safe. We haven't talked about how to forge custom tokens. Now, a UTXO transaction has some inputs depicted as red lines here and some outputs depicted as black lines. Now, each of those, the inputs, are associated with some value token bundles that flow into the transactions. And similarly, the outputs are also associated with the value. Now, crucial is the ledger property of value preservation, which means that the sum of all the inputs equals the sum of the outputs. For the multi-asset extension, we generalize transactions and introduce what we call a forge field. A forge field is also a value. It is a value which is contributed to the funds which are manipulated by this transaction. So they are a sort of input and handle in the equation in a corresponding manner. Now you may ask, can anybody just forge any tokens by including them in the forge field of a transaction? That wouldn't be a particularly safe system. Now, and let's go to token, back to token bundles to explain this point. So far, I've used easy to understand names for the asset groups. But in reality, they're actually cryptographic hashes. They're not just any old cryptographic hash. No, they're a hash of a script, something we call the policy script for that particular asset. A policy script is a smart contract which inspects the forge field of a transaction and makes sure that only the tokens which are permitted by the assets policy are being forged and no more. In fact, it is possible for these forged fields to not only have positive values, which means we create, we mint new tokens, but they can also be negative. So we can use the same mechanism to burn tokens, which is quite important in some contexts. Overall, we can think of this policy script for cryptocurrency as a sort of monetary policy, or for non-fungible tokens, their way to guarantee uniqueness. Because we are using as the hash of the policy script itself as the asset identifier, we tie the two together. Whenever a transaction appears on the ledger with a forge field with a non-zero entry for a particular asset, the ledger guarantees the policy script matching the hash gets executed on that transaction. And only if the policy script permits the forging, then is that transaction valid. That means the only custom code you have to write in order to create and manipulate custom tokens on Cardano are the policy scripts, which typically are quite simple and will provide a library of the standard. This makes the system also very lightweight. Moreover, this tying the hash to the asset identifier means we don't need a global asset registry, which means creating new assets is super cheap and easy. The system remains lightweight and easy to use. So we have a system, it's lightweight, it's affordable, it's safe, or sounds great. So what can you do? Of course, all the standard use cases apply. Creation of your own cryptocurrencies, even if they involve complex monetary policies, that's totally supported. And also non-fungible tokens using the same mechanism in order to represent virtual and physical goods. That's also supported by the system. But there's more. Because the creation of new assets and tokens is so lightweight in the system, we can use them for many more purposes. In particular, we use them to control smart contracts themselves 
in, in order to trade roles or access permissions and being able to trade them as well, just like first class objects on the ledger. Let me give you an example. Smart contracts are best described as state machines. And in previous work, we have shown the correspondence between so-called constraint emitting machines and transactions on the Cardano ledger. Now let me illustrate this in terms of one example. The state machine you're seeing here is for an on-chain multi-signature state machine. It's a multi-sig contract, but one where no off-chain infrastructure is required to collect signatures. Everything happens on-chain. Now, <clears throat> such a state diagram consists of states. Here we have two, holding and collecting. Holding is when the contract is just holding them funds. Collecting is when it's collecting signatures to approve a particular payment. Now, the transitions, the arrows between these states is guided by inputs or actions. Here, we can propose in the holding state a payment by a particular de deadline of a particular amount of funds to a particular party, and then we get into the collecting state. In the collecting state, we collect signatures. This is an N out of M multi-sig contract where M parties are involved and N, at least N, have to sign a particular proposal. For example, we could have three parties involved maintaining the funds, and for any payment, at least two signatures of two of these three participants need to be collected. Once sufficient number of signatures is achieved, payment can happen. If this doesn't happen by the given deadline, the proposal is canceled. Now, for each of the inputs, there are particular constraints that the transactions implementing the transitions have to fulfill. For example, when I propose a payment, this has to start with no signatures provided. That's the constraint underneath the proposal. We represent this on the ledger by a sequence of transactions. The first transaction in the initial state is in the holding state. Now, we can chain a second transaction as input providing a proposed input together with the parameters for this particular proposal. This takes us to the collecting state with no signatures so far. Then, in collecting, we can add signatures. If you add the signature, the state is extended, and so on. Unfortunately, without custom tokens, this has a problem. What if somebody just creates a transaction which represents a state in the middle of the execution of such a contract? This is a problem in this particular case. I could create a rogue state with already one signature included, but an incorrect, unauthorized signature. Nobody's going to check that, as you'll see in a moment. If we do a payment, all we check is that the number of signatures we have collected is exceeding or equal to M. No particular signature check beyond that is done. That is done, in fact, in the addition of a signature to the state of the contract. But because we created a rogue state, we basically jumped over the addition of the signatures. Hence, the check for validity has never been executed. The problem here is that we didn't start in the initial holding state of the contract. So that's something we have to enforce. And we can do this very nicely using custom tokens, using what we call a state thread token. A state thread token, given its policy script, can only be forged in the initial holding state and then must be passed from transaction to transaction together with the state of the contract. This is checked by the smart contract, otherwise the transactions will not be valid. Now such tokens we call proof of provenance because it allows the smart contracts, the presence of the token allows the smart contract to assert in every state that it actually originated from an initial state, here the holding state. And that avoids the problem of rogue states. 
This is just one example of how tokens can be used in a very flexible and lightweight manner to improve the development and use of smart contracts. We had proof of provenance. We can also use tokens to indicate participation, rights of participation, requirements of participation. We can use them to provide degrees of fairness. And there is a wide variety of other applications that can be derived from that. In fact, we can even trade access to contracts and ownership of contracts as goods themselves, virtual goods themselves on the ledger in this way. Now, if you've seen the talk on the Hydra off-chain scalability protocol in the science track, then you have already seen a very sophisticated application of this idea. If you haven't seen this talk, well, why not watch it later? Now, if you're interested in more details, there are three research papers by the Plutus team on the ISK library, which give you a lot more detail on the Cardano ledgers, UTXO model, and our support for multi-asset, including everything I've talked about in this presentation and more details about applications. Finally, if you are interested in seeing this in action, on Friday, there's going to be a presentation called the Plutus Platform, where you will see the system in action and um, you will see how these contracts are executed on actual implementation of the system. Here in the screenshot, you see the representation of the atomic swap uh, transaction, which we've discussed before in our new use interface. Thank you very much for your attention. And next up is Simon Thompson with details about the Marlow domain-specific language for financial contracts. Hello, I'm Simon Thompson. I'm research lead for the Marlow team. What I want to do in my section of this presentation, which comes after Phil's introduction to functional programming and, and Manuel talking about what's going on in Cardano and Plutus. I'd like to talk about Marlowe, which is a domain spe specific language for expressing financial contracts. Let me start off by saying a bit about why domain specific languages are interesting and particularly why they're interesting in this context. What we're trying to do in building a domain specific language is tailor a language to a particular set of use cases, not, not to fit the blockchain, not to fit the, the computer, but to fit a particular area. In this case, we're looking at the area of financial contracts. And if we write a domain specific language, we get some very definite benefits for users, for programmers. Because the language is specific, some mistakes are just impossible. We, we have a language which describes financial contracts. We can't describe things that have nothing to do with finance and accidentally have them come into the language. We control the constructs of the language, express the things that we need to do to build a financial contract. And because of that, because the contracts are more specific, it can be easier to write these contracts. We can build tools that help us to write contracts effectively. A really important aspect of this is that we can analyze the contracts that we write. Now, by that, I mean, of course, we can run those contracts, we could run them on blockchain, but we can analyze them without having to run them. And what's more, we can analyze all the possible ways that they might run with different inputs, different values from oracles and so on. And so we can we can do this for Marlowe, our language. We can check all the possible ways a contract can be evaluated, can, can be implemented, um, and that can be done without running the contract at all. So we can get certainty about how it will behave without running it. And also, without, without running it on the blockchain, we can simulate it. We can allow users to step through a contract, allowing it to evolve a few steps, undo some steps, try some other steps, so that you can get a very strong sense of how a contract behaves, either by simulating it or by analyzing it, before you commit your money to running it. So we're, that gives us trustworthiness. It gives us um, a degree of robustness that you don't get with a general purpose language. And 
What we wanted to do was see how DSLs worked on blockchain. And of course, there are a whole lot of ideas that we might build a DSL for. We might decide to try and describe insurance contracts, for example, on blockchain. Um, and we might do that because we want to keep a record so that people can see that a certain thing is insured, you know, and that record is there transparently for anyone to inspect. We might want to monitor the supply chain of a particular good or service. But what we decided to do was concentrate on financial contracts. And we did that because there's an existing body of work um, on building languages to express finan financial contracts. So we wanted to build in an area where we knew it was possible to build successful DSLs. We can also see a number of potential markets for this work. For example, financial institutions might want to offer this contract language to their um, customers as a way of customers checking constraints that have been um, checking that contracts are running in an appropriate way. Contracts in the real world can be mirrored on the blockchain. So we can build a record, a trace of what's gone on in a contract on the blockchain. Or we might want to do something peer to peer. We might want to build contracts that in DeFi um, space allow participants simply to build contracts and execute them for a, for a loan or something without a third party intervening. And we see it also as a prototype for other DSLs. So it's not simply we want to do financial contracts and stop there, but we can see a whole range of DSLs on blockchain. And finally, um, there is a standard out there called the Actor Standard for, which describes all a taxonomy of all the different kinds of financial contract. And we wanted to, um, we wanted to look at that and use that as a test for what we were doing with our financial contract language. And if you want to find out more about that, there's a presentation on day two in track three at 17.30 UTC. And I'd encourage you to come along to that. But let's get started thinking about what a financial contract actually consists of. Financial contracts 101, what goes on when we build a financial contract? Well, money gets transferred from participant to participant. Some choices might be made. A participant may, may decide to continue down one track with a contract or go down another. They might choose to sell an asset or stick with an asset. So we need to, to model how those choices can, um, can be made. Also, the contract will probably take in information from the outside world. As well as choices, there's real world information. You know, the spot price of oil on the Aberdeen market at noon on the 29th of February, for example. That could, information can be used to control how the contract will evolve. We need to think about how to deal with that in our modeling. And also when we look at financial contracts in the real world, they are controlled, they exist within a legal system which ensures compliance. If participants don't comply, then other participants have recourse to the legal system to get compensation. If we're living in a permissionless world, we need to think about how to ensure compliance in a different way. So what do we do when we go on to blockchain? We have to think about a number of things. We have to think about payments. Um, and what we've chosen to do is model payments as two separate things. We think about payments into a contract, we call those deposits, versus payments out of a contract or within a contract. And we just call those payments. Um, and I'll talk in a second about why we make that distinction. How do we handle oracles like a, something that gives a stock price? We simply, within Marlowe, treat the oracle as another participant. Um, you know, how, we, how we accredit that participant and how we choose, how the participants in the contract choose to use that oracle is, is not within the language itself. We simply, we see it's a place from which we get information. And what we need to do in ensuring um, and trying to get as strong compliance as we can, there are two, th two aspects of that. We need to avoid bad behavior. We need to avoid people doing the wrong thing. 
But also, and equally important, we need to make sure that good things keep on happening. We need to ensure engagement. And let's think about that in terms of um, payments. The contract describes payments out to participants, and it's easy to see from that where, where the money goes. So the contract language describes that very clearly. And we can indeed automate that process. If the contract is holding some money, we can automate the transfer of that money to someone's wallet. But what about payments in? What do we do there? Well, all we can do, the contract can't make somebody make a deposit, all we can do is ask for a deposit. And in the contract asking for that, we have to avoid somebody simply walking away. In the contract here, if we've got Alice, Bob and Carol, suppose Alice has committed some money to the contract and then Bob is asked to commit some money and he just decides to walk away. Alice's money could potentially be locked up forever. So what we need to do is ask for a deposit, but never ask for that indefinitely. We always ask within a timeout. We say, Alice uh, or Bob, please make a deposit by this time. Otherwise, we'll do something else. Um, and because of this, all the contracts we write in Marlowe have a finite lifetime. There can be no indefinite commitment of money to a contract. And that's a, it's one of the ways in which the design of the language ensures certain sorts of things can't happen. We ensure that all the contracts written in Marlowe have finite lifetimes. There's no indefinite commitment of money. Now, what does the language look like? It's modelled as a, a, a data type in Haskell, and we've got five uh, constructs in the language. We can close a contract down. We can make a payment. We can switch according to um, some observation, which might involve external information or the current slot number or, or a number of things. And finally, we can wait for something to happen. We can wait for a case to happen, and cases are triggered by actions. And finally, we have a let, which I'm not going to talk about any more here. It's a way of capturing a value like um, the value of, of the, the oil price for use later on in a contract. But the key combinators, the key combining forms here are closing, payment, if and when. And let's talk about those in a bit more detail. What happens when we close a contract? When we close a contract, we refund any money left in the contract to the owners of accounts within the contract. All the money locked in a, in a contract belongs in accounts so that we know who the money has to go back to when the contract ends. We can ensure that money goes back to the right person. We can make a payment, pay a value to a payee from a particular account. And then what happens next? That's the fourth thing in this um, in this term is the, we call it continuation, it's the contract that we carry on executing. And similarly with, with an if construct, we have a condition, if the condition is true at this point, we do uh, the contract T, if the condition is false, we do contract F. So we, we do one of two contracts according to whether or not the condition is true. And finally in the when case, we have in, inside a when construct, we have a list of cases, we have a timeout and we have a continuation. And each case is an action paired with a contract. And what we do is we wait up to the timeout to see when one of the actions happens. We then perform the following contract, the corresponding contract. So we wait when the action happens, whichever of the actions we're waiting for, we do the corresponding contract. But if none of those, and that might be, for example, a deposit, we could be waiting for someone to deposit money in the contract. If none of the actions happens, then at the timeout, we do the continuation. We do the contract, as it were, the default. So in a when, we know that something will have happened by the time of the timeout, either because of an action happening or because we hit the timeout. So things keep progressing. Now, how do we write Marlowe contracts? We can just write them as text, but we can provide two other ways of building contracts. One is we can build them by linking together blocks in a system called Blockly. And that allows people to build contracts without writing any code. We're building the code entirely visually. And 
there's a block corresponding to each of the constructs of the language. You can see in the example there, we have a when, which is waiting for a deposit, and in, after that, waiting for another deposit, and then a payment is made. And we assemble those together in a visual editor. Alternatively, we can, because the Marlowe language is a, a, a data type inside Haskell, we can just use that fact to use Haskell to describe contracts. You can see on the left, we've got a top level contract called unimaginatively contract, and that's got a short expression, but it uses other things defined elsewhere in the file, like the inner part of the contract, which is defined further down. So we're able to describe contracts using abbreviations, using functions defined inside Haskell. So we have a number of ways of writing Marlowe contracts. We can also simulate the action of a Marlowe contract, because at any point during a contract, and this is another advantage of using a special purpose a domain specific language, we can predict the next actions for a contract. So we can, for example, see that we're waiting for the investor participant to deposit a thousand ADA. And so as we simulate, our, uh, the system, system, our tool can tell us, oh, the next thing to happen is that the investor needs to um, make a deposit. So we can try some actions, we can then undo them, try some other actions and so on. And just to be clear, this is simulating from a sort of an omniscient point of view. We get, we have, we're in the perspective of all the participants together. Now, of course, when you're running the contract for real, you can only do actions which are um, like deposits being made by, by you or choices being made by you. But in this simulation, it's a godlike simulation, you can do what you can simulate the, part, the um, actions of all the participants. We can also analyze Marlowe contracts. We can check every possible path through the contract without running the contract itself. And we can check to see that certain properties hold. A major property is that when we make a payment, that payment can happen. And what we want to look for is, is there any possibility that doesn't work. And what we can do is generate a counterexample based on a, a, an approach called satisfaction modulo theories using the Z3 tool, we can actually generate counterexamples. So in the example you see here, we're seeing that the analysis has resulted in a warning. There's a partial payment transaction in, in, um, in a transaction. The contract was meant to pay 1,010 $1, ADA. It could only pay 110. So we've got a problem there. So we can do that without this happening in a running contract. It's happening as part of the analysis. And finally, we can use what's called formal verification to prove mathematically inside a, a, a what's called a theorem prover. Um, we use Isabel. We can prove properties of the semantics. We can prove that accounts can never have negative amounts of money. It's a nice property to know. We, can, we also use a property that's, that on which we build a more efficient static analysis. So without loss of generality, each transaction that we use to um, implement something in the contract has at most one input, and that allows us to do more efficient analysis. Um, but we can also prove uh, in, with this approach properties of templates, properties of, of contracts where um, we don't have concrete values for payments, we just have, have variables. So we can, we can potentially prove things there as well. All of this analysis and simulation and composition is embedded in the Marlowe Playground, which is a browser-based environment for developing and um, simulating, analyzing contracts. You can find this um, at alpha.marlowe.iohkdev.io and there's a tutorial which will take you through this in detail on day two of the conference, track four at 21.30 UTC. And I'd encourage you to go along to that or view the, view the recording. So Marlowe as a, as a domain specific language, where it just works for financial contracts and that gives us these advantages. We can check all paths um, and give a result in our static analysis. It means that when we simulate a Marlowe contract, we can say exactly at each point what the inputs um, will be. We write languages that are more readable because they're written 
in the language of, um, you know, of payment and deposit and so on. And because it's embedded inside Haskell, we can use Haskell sparingly to give us abbreviations and to give us um, definitions of functions or templates, if you will. So that's where we are with Marlowe. Where we're heading is that Marlowe will be part of the, of the um, Cardano system. It, Marlowe is implemented as a, a, an interpreter in Plutus for Marlowe contracts. And what we see um, is it's building very clearly on the EUTXO model, on that functional approach to building, um, to building blockchain. As I say, it's, a, it's interpreted as a single Plutus program. And we use the multi-currency in, in Cardano to give us tokenized and securitized roles. So we can, we can transfer roles in a running contract. And indeed, we can split a role in a running contract into number of, of, um, a number of pieces. So each, each owner of a piece of that gets a payment from the contract, for example. Um, and as part of that, as parts of the contract run on the, on the blockchain, we'll also be providing an off-chain user interface to allow you to interact with your running Marlow contracts, and in particular to support automation of those contracts. So I think just to conclude, we have the um, we have Marlow, which is a, a language for expressing financial contracts on the Cardano blockchain. It allows us to author, simulate, analyze, verify Marlow contracts. There's the address of the playground. There's the a reminder of where the playground presentation. And also, if you want to find out more, there are tutorials embedded in the playground. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner there. And also, um, there's a link there to a set of, of um, YouTube videos which go into Marlowe in a bit more detail. So thank you very much. <laughs>